Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a prehistoric croc with crushing teeth has been discovered, the early evolution of Homo floresiensis has been investigated, a missing link in pterosaur evolution has been found, and much more. Starting off the news this week, the world's biggest iceberg has become a little stuck. The iceberg known as A23A has become victim to something known as a Taylor Column, a phenomenon first described a century ago where an ocean current can split into two separate flows. In this case, these two separate flows are making A23A constantly spin on the spot. A23A separated from Antarctica and became an iceberg quite a while ago, back in 1986, but has had a much slower journey than usual as it spent about three decades stuck in the Weddell Sea, before continuing its journey back in 2020. While it doesn't look like this iceberg is going to be anything close to immortal, it was expected to have joined the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, a massively powerful ocean current that would have, and may someday still, push it into the South Atlantic Ocean, where the warmer waters would destroy it. The big question now, of course, is how long A23A will carry on happily spinning away before being blasted to its death. The answer is, perhaps predictably, we're not sure, but it might be a fairly long time. Another example of an iceberg being trapped in a Taylor Column ocean current had its spin for years, so A23A may be consigned to a similar fate. In other news, a rather fun study was published this week in the Open Journal of Astrophysics that has looked at what could be left behind from the collapse of a theoretical warp drive. Warp drives may sound like science fiction, and they kinda still are, the work has been done in the past on how they could still work with our current understanding of science. The basic premise is that a ship could create a warp bubble around it, which contracted the fabric of space-time in front and expanded it behind, hence allowing the ship to travel, relatively to us at least, faster than light. It's worth noting that there are some issues with the theoretical warp drive, then it's not just a case of working on it or finding the right bits, but it still adheres to the scientific principles of today, even if it threatens to break them. As this has actually had some research done on it in the past, this new paper used the science behind it to calculate what may happen if the warp drive collapsed. The results suggested that the collapse would create gravitational waves, ripples in space-time first predicted by Einstein and first detected back in 2015. They are created by some of the most cataclysmic events in the universe, like the collisions of black holes or supernovae. The paper says the gravitational waves produced by the collapsing warp drive wouldn't be detectable with modern equipment, unlike those produced by the other events mentioned. While this study may seem a little bit useless at the moment as we are nowhere near close to understanding how we might actually make a warp drive, it does help with understanding the proposed negative energy matter that we don't currently know exists that is needed for the theoretical warp drive to work. Certainly, at the very least, an interesting study that makes us again wonder how we might, one day, get to the stars we've been staring up at for so long. Also in the recent news is yet another major wildfire causing devastation as it indiscriminately burns through brushland and homes. This particular fire is in the Shandin Hills area of Southern California's San Bernardino County. It started on Monday afternoon and 200 firefighters are assigned to fight the blaze. There are wildfires ablaze around the world. There are fires in five regions of Russia which have seen twice as many fires recorded by mid-April compared to the same period in 2023. There are also wildfires in Albania and Croatia as intense heat grips the continent. The huge wildfire in Jasper National Park in Canada which started on July 22nd continues to burn and sadly a young firefighter has recently lost his life. So far this year, over 28,000 wildfires have burned more than 4.5 million acres in the United States, which is above average for the last decade and is already more than what was burned in all of 2023. In the US, the expected peak of this year's fire season is still more than a month away and the fires are burning at a level of intensity rarely seen at this point in the summer. There are three essential ingredients for larger wildfires, dry fuel, hot, dry and windy weather, and a source of ignition. Climate change is making two of those more common, hence the prevalence of these wildfires around the globe. First up in the paleontology news for this week is the very exciting description of a new species of pterosaur the flying reptiles that coexisted with the dinosaurs. This new species is a very important one too, as it's turned out to be a sort of transitional pterosaur that now links the older, more basal rampharynchoids and the more derived pterodactyloids. 
It's been named Proterodactylus francolae, and it was discovered in late Jurassic aged rocks in southeast Germany, and would have been a part of the Solnhofen archipelago fauna that lived around this reef platform complex. The fossil has been on display at the Dinosauria Museum Altmutal for a while, and in fact you can see the Boneheads crew and I visit this museum and talk about this very specimen in part 2 of our Germany adventures. Anyway, the Proterodactylus fossil is incredibly well preserved, being a squashed specimen that preserves the entire articulated skull and skeleton in amazing condition. The skeleton shows a remarkable combination of both more basal rampharynchoid features, such as its interlocking tailbones and a functional fifth toe, as well as the derived pterodactyloid characters, including the shape of the skull and the shortness of its tail. Looking at the evolutionary position of Proterodactylus, it was indeed found to be a very basal pterodactyloid. However, the fact that it lived at a time after certain, more derived pterodactyloid lineages had already appeared indicates that this pterosaur was a surviving relict, with its ancestors splitting off earlier in the Jurassic around the time that this major pterosaur transition was occurring. So Proterodactylus tells us lots of important things about this point in pterosaur evolution and fills in a significant knowledge gap. Also this week, a new species of prehistoric crocodiliform has been named. This species had crushing teeth used for crunching down on hard-shelled prey, such as snails and insects. The croc was unearthed in Argentina, in rocks dating back to the oldest part of the late Cretaceous, about 99 to 97 million years ago. And it's actually from the same geological formation that Giganotosaurus was found in. It's been named Araripisuchus manzanensis, bringing the total number of named species within the genus Araripisuchus to seven at least until they inevitably get reclassified. Araripisuchus was a kind of crocodiliform called a Notosuchian, a fascinating and incredibly diverse branch of the croc evolutionary tree that includes all sorts of terrestrial species, such as herbivorous ones, pug-faced ones, species with armadillo-like armour, duck-snouted ones, and very large hypercarnivorous species. The new Araripisuchus manzanensis, however, was fairly small and relatively lightly built, though still with thin armoured osteoderms across the body, based on what we know from other Araripisuchus species. The fossil material known for the new species includes skull material, jaws, and a partial arm bone. And, very interestingly, the teeth towards the back of the jaws are quite bulbous with flattened tips, ideal for crushing hard prey items. This dentition would have been perfect for biting down on snails or insects found in the arid region it inhabited. It also would have been coexisting with another Araripisuchus species, the previously named Araripisuchus butyriensis, which doesn't have crushing teeth, suggesting that these two little crocs were specialised for feeding on different prey, therefore avoiding competing with one another in this shared environment. A brilliant new discovery. Next up in the Paleo News, a new species of tiny prehistoric penguin has been discovered. It was found in New Zealand in rocks dating to the late Oligocene Epoch, about 24 million years ago. It's been named Pacudiptes hakataromea, and it's known from an almost complete left humerus, plus a piece of left ulna, and a bit of the right femur, all of which were collected in 1987. The fossils have now been recognised as coming from a new species, and Pacudiptes turns out to be the earliest known tiny penguin, with a body size similar to the modern little blue penguin, standing about 30 to 35 centimetres tall, or about 11.8 to 13.8 inches. Analysing the anatomical features visible on the bones, paleontologists have found that Pacudiptes fills a gap in our understanding of penguin evolution, specifically how the modern wing evolved from more ancient forms, as Pacudiptes has a shoulder joint like like that of modern penguins, but an elbow joint more like older prehistoric ones. Looking at the bone microstructure, it was also found that Pacudiptes likely had a similar swimming ability to modern little penguins, swimming about and diving in shallow waters. Another fantastic find. We've got more news from the world of bird evolution next, as a recently published study has analysed patterns of bird molecular evolution and discovered that the KPG mass extinction event, which wiped out the non-bird dinosaurs, along with various other groups of organisms 66 million years ago, caused some significant shifts in the evolution of bird genomes. These shifts in the genomes of bird groups that originated near the KPG boundary were found to coincide with these lineages shifting to develop generally smaller adult body sizes and an increase in species with hatchlings that were still dependent on their parents for feeding. Essentially then, they found that the directional selection pressures enforced on surviving bird lineages by the KPG mass extinction event may have shifted the patterns of these animals' genome evolution, highlighting the important fact that not only do mass extinctions affect biodiversity and ecology, but they can also directly influence the genomic evolution of groups as well. 
Also in the news this week is the incredible discovery of a fossil from the Cambrian period dating to more than 514 million years ago, which preserves the three-dimensional structure of the internal organs. This tiny fossil, only 3.9 millimeters long, is a larval stage of an ancient yew arthropod, the grouping of so-called true arthropods that includes all modern species. It was uncovered from rocks in southwestern China, and it's been named as the new species, Yuti Yuanshi. Usually, fossils dating back to this time period are preserved as compacted flat specimens, but the 3D preservation of UT enabled paleontologists to scan the specimen and reveal digestive glands, a circulatory system, traces of nerves, and the regions of the brain. The fact that it's a larva is very significant too, as it provides a unique insight into the early developmental stages of these animals, clarifying the sequence of evolutionary events that led from early, more worm-like lobopodian ancestors to species with body plans more like true arthropods. An absolutely stunning new fossil. And finally for the news this week, some new discoveries from Flores Island in Indonesia of bones belonging to the extinct small-bodied human species Homo floresiensis have revealed some interesting insights into their early evolution. Homo floresiensis, nicknamed the Hobbits, were first described based on fossils found in a limestone cave on Flores that dated to between 100,000 and 60,000 years ago, with these individuals likely standing at about 3 foot 7. The fossils described in this new research, however, come from another locality dating to between 770,000 and 650,000 years ago, and include a humerus and teeth. Fossils from the second, much older locality have been described previously and were tentatively suggested to belong to Homo floresiensis, but these new finds now confirm that they are indeed from the same species. The new material also shows that the arm bone was 9 to 16% shorter than the same bone in the younger fossils of the species, plus it's smaller than any other reported adult hominin humerus from this period of time. The new teeth found here are also incredibly small, and actually show some similarities to early Javanese Homo erectus, lending more support to the hypothesis that Homo floresiensis evolved from Homo erectus that somehow made it to the island, rather than the alternate idea that Homo floresiensis is actually derived from an even older radiation of humans, such as the more basal Homo habilis. Therefore, the study suggests that the H. floresiensis lineage was a long-lasting one, evolving from these earlier H. erectus after they washed up on the island sometime between 1.3 and 1 million years ago, and undergoing a significant body size reduction over the next 300,000 years, remaining at a small size until their extinction. The fact that these hominins underwent a body size reduction is also said to imply that the giant reptilian predators of the island, such as the 3 meter long Komodo dragons and crocodiles, did not pose a serious threat to the early Homo floresiensis populations. The extinction of these people sometime around 50,000 years ago does coincide with the arrival of Homo sapiens on Flores, however, an event that the authors say they suspect precipitated the demise of H. floresiensis. So, lots of fascinating new information discovered about these amazing ancient humans. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Benji Thomas if you'd like for more short form videos about science news and extinct animals, plus updates from me and the 7 Days of Science crew. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.